Well, hello, and welcome to Redaction on this really sweltering summer's evening. Excuse me if I, excuse me if I look a bit flushed. Um, uh, for our regular viewers, as you know, I'm James Moles, um, the co-editor of Redaction Report, and I'm joined today by our old Redaction friend and now the Morning Stars parliamentary reporter, Matt Trinder. Hey, Matt, how are you doing? Great. How are you, James? I'm not too bad. Just, you know, uh, slowly melting and um, uh, it's, 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 it's a British summer, you know. It's not that bad, really, to think about it, but... Um, yeah, and it's going to be gone soon, so let's enjoy it. Why not? Well, I mean, we never enjoy the weather, do we? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, today we have a simple task before us. We're, we're, we're fixing the Labour Party. So, um, no small feat. We've only got 45 minutes. I know. Um, so, we're going to be looking at um, a few recent Labour election results and what they mean, what went wrong, and what can be fixed. So, for some context, um, the Labour Party at the last general election endured its worst defeat in terms of seat numbers since uh, 1935, only got 202 seats in uh, the House of Commons out of uh, out of more than 600, 650, I think. 650, that's the one, beat me to it. Um, out of six, 202 out of 650 seats. Um, that was under Jeremy Corbyn, who was widely perceived as one of the left of the Labour Party. Uh, Keir Starmer, who's seen as more of a moderate in the Labour Party is now a Labour leader, but we've also had some fairly disastrous results under him. Uh, local elections earlier this year were a bit of a travesty, lost uh, the by-election in Hartlepool, largely seen as a safe Labour seat beforehand, but was a Brexit voting seat, swung to the Tories. Um, there was another by-election recently in the Yorkshire constituency of Batley and Spen. Labour had won before and held before, and Labour held on just by the skin of its teeth to this constituency. Um, we're going to be looking into these results and more. But Matt, over to you. What's going wrong at the moment? Well, maybe, maybe it's easier to say um, what's going right, which isn't much. Um, I know Sakir was very keen to say after the Batley and Spen result that Labour was coming home, tapping into the uh, the football euphoria that was um, that was around at the time, but really it was a very uh, well a very disappointing result. Some would say disastrous for Labour. I think they won by three hundred and twenty two votes, if my memory serves me correctly. Um, this this has been a, a pretty safe Labour seat since, yeah. It's been a pretty safe Labour seat since 1997. There are lots of ethnic minority voters, Muslim voters in the seat, which traditionally back Labour. And of course, Labour isn't in power and it's a by-election where you would expect opposition parties to romp home, especially in the context of what I would argue is the Tories' disastrous handling of the coronavirus pandemic. And it came after the whole Matt Hancock snogging debacle, et cetera. So for Labour just to, to sneak home in that context is, is very worrying for them. Um, there are signs from, uh, well, from the vote itself and from surveys that Muslim voters are drifting away from Labour. Thousands of them backed um, George Galloway's Workers' Party. Um, he stood in Batley and Spen explicitly to try and um, try and lose the seat for Sakir so he could be forced out as Labour leader. So I know that Sakir will try and use the win as, as a positive, which is what all political leaders do when they lose a by-election. They say, oh, it's only a by-election. It doesn't matter. Um, local context is important. And of course, when they win one, they say, well, this is proof that nationally I'm doing great. But um, there, there are there are warning signs there that they need to do something about, for sure. Hmm. 
I think there are a couple of points of context to be raised there. First of all, I think we need to talk about the Euros. Um, we need to talk about the football. I mean, I mean obviously, obviously, Marcus Rashford is the hero that um, we need but don't deserve at the moment. Um, yeah. But um, yes, obviously, because Sir Keir Starmer uh, flogged the uh, Labour's coming home slogan just in the context of the Euros. I mean, based on what happened in the Euros, I think that might be slightly bad omens, but uh, that remains to be seen. Um, you also mentioned Matt Hancock, who, of course, was the, um, the United Kingdom's health secretary um, up until very recently. A, was caught in a scandal in which on CCTV in his office, he was caught, um, well, let's not mince words, having an affair um, at a time when he was encouraging everyone else to maintain social distancing and um, maintain their various bubbles and not um, not mixing that context, shall we say. So, uh, <laughs> but yes, um, on the subject of Batley and Spen, you mentioned, of course, George Galloway. But Labour won this election in the end in spite of that vote split. Why do you think that was? I think there was a lot of sympathy for the way Labour's candidate, um, Kim Ledbetter, was, was treated during the campaign. Um, she did suffer a lot of harassment in the street. And, of course, we have to look at the context of of what happened to her sister, Jo Cox, who, of course, was brutally murdered by a far-right nationalist um, in 2016. During the Brexit um, Yeah, just before the Brexit vote. So um, I, think, I think there was a lot of local support for her. And all politics is local. So especially in a by-election where you don't have a national narrative that's dominating people's minds, if there is a local candidate who is popular, then he or her will get the party over the line. And I think that's what happened here. But I, I couldn't help but smile when I saw Sakir the next day saying, oh, Labour's coming home. This is how Labour can win by um, having a popular local candidate and engaging local people. I mean, for me, that's exactly what he's not doing on a national level, that's the lesson that he needs to learn. You know, if anything, he's he's attacking um, Labour members at the grassroots level. Uh, we cover this a lot in the Morning Star. Um, people at the local level claiming that they've been expelled from the party for no apparent reason and um, alleging all sorts of dirty tricks going on at local level. So. I agreed with him when he was saying that, but I thought, well, you're you're the one person who's who's not doing that. That's the success story of the Corbyn years that that you seem to be deliberately ignoring. So um, hopefully he can reflect on that and think, oh, maybe I'll I'll stop doing that. But I don't know. I mean, it struck me as one thing with the Conservative campaign in Batley and Spain is who was the Conservative candidate? Oh, his name slips my mind now. I think that sums it up, doesn't it? I think the, <laughs> yeah. Tories, the, Tories, the Tories basically sat on the sidelines and said, OK, let's let Labour and Galloway dunk it out and we can slip through the middle. That was basically that was the plan. Massively cynical strategy, and of course it backfired. Um, unlike, I mean, what you say interestingly about the sort of, the strength of having a good local candidate is interesting, because I feel that's the mistake Labour made in Hartlepool, a violation a few sure. months earlier, where they stood, um, uh, for some context, Hartlepool is a constituency in County Durham, uh, heavily, usually heavily Labour voting constituency. You know, the idea of when Hartlepool votes Tory is the idea of, is almost historically synonymous with when hell freezes over, where they're talking yeah. that sort of level, yet... Um, it did just vote Tory, um, and soon Satan will arise. But um, <laughs> you know, um, it's it's an old port town, uh, an old coastal town uh, in the north of England, uh, historically Labour voting area, um, heavily Brexit voting constituency. About seventy percent of the population voters leave the European Union, and the candidate uh, that 
um, Labour put forward in the recent by-election was um, non-local. Originally, um, he has he's worked in the area, granted, but he's originally a southerner, uh, contesting a northern seat. I get the logic behind his candidacy. He's an NHS doctor, Dr. Paul Williams, former MP for another regional constituency. But the idea of appointing an NHS doctor as your candidate, given the current circumstances, I think, you know, on the surface is a smart move. At the same time, there were various circumstances around this by-election that lost Labour the election, not least was the Brexit stance. And if we consider the 2019 election in this constituency, um, the Brexit party vote was actually quite high in this constituency. Mm -hmm. uh, Richard Tice, who's now the leader of uh, what was the Brexit party and uh, is now Reform UK, um, was the candidate in that uh, seat in 2019. And between him, the Tory vote would have exceeded the Labour vote had it all coalesced around one candidate. So it's not entirely surprised that it went to the Tories. What was your reaction to that by-election? Well, it was, I, I expected it because um, that's obviously, that was obviously the direction of travel leading up to it. But, but it was still one of those moments that you don't forget in politics. It's one of those earthquake moments that, you know, you suspect things are changing and then there it is in front of you, you know, the Tories take Hartlepool. It had been Labour since 1974, I believe, since the constituency was created. Um, there was a similar constituency in the area that had been Labour since um, 1964. And that part of the country, the North East is, is, you know, should be Labour's stronghold. So, the fact that the Tories won so convincingly showed that Boris Johnson's kind of levelling up agenda was really paying dividends for the Tories in those kind of seats. But it also showed that the disillusionment with Labour that had been building, I think, arguably since 2001, um, was really boiling over. Um, I, I believe the Labour candidate in the local area as well, uh, the NHS doctor you mentioned, um, I think he was a, a Remain supporter as he well, was, which, yes. is, yeah, which is another reason why he, he was a, a terrible choice. Um, and I think it was another reason why Sakir's leadership team kind of um, didn't consult locally on, on the matter enough, I think he was just kind of imposed and um, the, the predicted result happened. Labour's left were warning that, that it was a bad choice. Um, but, but luckily they, they didn't do that in Batley and Spen. I think Sakir realised that if he lost that seat, then the pressure on him to go might not have been irresistible, but it would have been a very difficult summer for him. But now you can see there's a, a spring back in his step, even though I, I would argue uh, there shouldn't be because the problems are still there, but he's safe for the time being. Well, absolutely. I think that's right. He's, bat, the Batley and Spen result saved him. I think he would have been on borrowed time if he'd lost Batley and Spen. There's, a, there's only so long you can last as a opposition leader if you can't win any by-elections. You know, by-elections are meant to be easy wins for the opposition. Yeah. There's only so many times yeah. that Government parties make gains in by-elections, and yet here we are with Hartlepool. And if you know Boris Johnson, Conservative, has made two consecutive gains in by-elections, that would have been disastrous. I think Starmer's position would have been untenable at that point. But I think you're right. I don't think he would have resigned voluntarily at that point. There would have been a ugly leadership challenge. And you know, if I were a betting man, I reckon he'd probably have still clung on in spite of a leadership challenge. Yeah, I, I know that the, the it left just left were... the party even worse tatters than before. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Labour's left were clearly ready to make some kind of move if he lost that by-election. You only need 40 MPs to back a challenge for there to be one, and there are 36 MPs in the Socialist Campaign Group of the Labour Party, for example. So 
I don't think it would have been difficult for them to find a few more. But after the loss of Jeremy Corbyn, the left doesn't have a figurehead. Some have been touted, like the current deputy leader, Angela Rayner, um, or perhaps but she is not. So she's just campaign group. We should clarify. Yeah, exactly. She's um, some on the left would say she's better than New Labour. She's not a Blairite, but um, she's certainly not. Um, I think that's true of Starmer. Not the socialist yeah. still. I mean, for all Starmer's flaws, he's not a Blairite. Yeah, I mean, he's he's to the left of Blair in many ways, but um, he's nowhere near um, left enough for me. <laughs> yes. Um, Andy Burnham, of course, is another potential figurehead that the left could coalesce around the Manchester mayor, but of course he's not even an MP. But, so I mean, he, a, a look, of course, he historically comes from the right of the party as well. Yes, I feel a lot, a lot of people, I think, on the left feel, I mean, possibly myself included, that he could be sort of that Biden figure, that sort of someone who comes historically from the right of the party, but is willing to work with the left. And is willing yeah, to I think he had like over time and end up with a more progressive government than they might have done had they been in power 20 years before. Yeah, he he had Blairite training, we'll put it that way. So he was up and coming in the Labour Party when that was the only game in town. But I think through his actions as the Manchester mayor and when he was an MP, he's shown that his instincts are are to the left and I think he's shown some great local leadership during the the COVID pandemic he's really called out a lot of a lot of failings in Westminster so he's probably the the, the brightest long-term hope say again the king in the north as some might say yes 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 as some yeah some do no he's, he's no, uh, the, uh, a bit of a legend. Again, again this is not good this is not good omens if you've actually watched Game of Thrones and know in what context that was chanted but um <laughs> yeah, let's hope we're not in Game of Thrones territory yet, but we'll see. Yes, absolutely. Mm. But of course, there was another by-election in the not too distant past that you know I feel I feel like a lot of people haven't framed it this way. So there have been two the two most recent by-elections were those in Cheshire and Amersham and in Batley and Spen. So in Cheshire and Amersham. This was a Tory safe seat in the home counties, sort of the sort of fairly leafy suburban counties surrounding London, where you know you get a lot of fairly affluent professionals who commute into London, and uh, you know usually Tory voting constituencies. Chesham and Amersham, which was a constituency that voted fifty-five percent to remain in the European Union in the referendum, is still voted Tory in twenty seventeen. And 2019, but in this by-election now, it was an absolutely overwhelming swing to the Liberal Democrats. Massive. It was a seat, that, and that was completely unpredicted. Most people were expecting the Tories to hold it. And then, of course, the Tories were expected to take back and spend from Labour, and they didn't. I feel there are very few people who are framing this in the way that there were two consecutive by-election losses for the Conservatives in elections they were meant to win. What's happening there? Well, I wouldn't say they were meant to win in Batley and Spen because, of course, it is meant to be a safe Labour seat. So they they thought they could win, and some, after Hartlepool, I they guess, started to assume that they would. Favourites to win. Yeah, I think... Um, okay, not quite yeah. to the same extent in Hartlepool, granted, but they were still odds-on to win. Yeah, I think change uh, things change though when Labour picked the candidate that they did in Batley and Spen. I think because then it was like, okay, yes. this, is, this I mean, is different. Uh, for context, this was Kim Ledbetter, of course, who was Jim yeah. Cox's sister and you know, was clearly a very you know talented campaigner. If you've watched, very popular locally. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Um, I think Chesham and Amersham, though, is very significant for the Tories. You're already seeing them change or seeing Boris Johnson change his approach on the levelling up agenda. So the by-election in Chesham and Amersham in Buckinghamshire was dominated by the issue of planning laws. 
So Boris Johnson is proposing to liberalize those laws to boost um, home building because supposedly he wants to help a generation of young people buy a home, which is pretty much impossible for most of us these days. Local people reacted against that. They were saying that this is going to see the Chilterns countryside, which surrounds our seats, um, destroyed. There's going to be unregulated house building um, left, right and centre. So uh, there was this massive kind of revolt against those plans and they swung behind the Lib Dems who ran a very effective local campaign. I think their leader, Sir Ed Davey, visited I don't know, five or six times, they really threw their, their weight behind it. So Possibly even more than that, from what I hear. Yeah, he was there all the time, whereas I think Boris Johnson only visited once. And then there so was that were, quite, were um, I don't know, peak thick of it uh, scene after that by-election when he literally constructed a blue wall <laughs> and knocked it down with a yellow hammer saying, we're smashing down the blue wall. Yeah. But I think I think um, I think you you're onto something here. People often talked about how the Conservatives smashed down the red wall in the north of England by appealing to certain sensitivities there. Yet at the same time, you know, I used to be a local journalist in Dorset, and I remember talking about sort of whenever we get stories about sort of government investment programs, and you'd get people saying about oh, are they just going to be politically correct and send all the money to the North? More or less, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. And I think there are probably those sort of sensitivities in the home counties that might have voted Tory in the past, like Chesham and Amersham. And, you know, you get sort of constituencies in provincial London, like, you know, Twickenham and you know, Ed Davies' own constituency of Kingston and Surbiton, which, you know, might swing between the Lib Dems and the Tories. Um... And I think, you know, if the Lib Dems play their cards right, they could seriously make gains in the home counties if Conservatives are bent on um, uh, putting their energy into swinging over the north. I, yeah, I, the, the, to the Tories now have what used to be Labour's problem, or well, it still is Labour's problem, but how do you win in the north and the south, particularly in modern Britain, where there's such a divide between the North and South after the Thatcher years. So well, Blair's the Tories have- make sure, make sure not enough people turn out to vote. Yes, yes, of course. That's the whole neoliberal agenda, isn't it? Let's just bore everyone and then we'll, we'll, um, we'll sneak through. Um, the Tories have two big priorities at the moment, or they say they do, which is leveling up and global Britain after we've left the EU. The problem is those two priorities are often contradictory. So look at the UK steel industry, which is in big trouble at the moment. Um, earlier this month, or maybe last month, um, the, the Tories looked at ending subsidies that had been rolled over from the EU to protect British steel from foreign imports. Um, Donald Trump put imports on Chinese, tariffs on imports of Chinese steel, and the EU was worried that then Europe would be flooded with Chinese steel, so they put tariffs on, on it. This was in, um, I think, 20, 2017 or something like that. So those tariffs rolled over when we left the EU. Now, if you get rid of those tariffs, the UK steel industry probably couldn't survive. So that's not very good for the leveling up agenda because many of the people that work in those communities are in Northern or, or, or seats in the Midlands. So trying to achieve global Britain where you're saying, okay, we're moving away from a kind of focus on the EU's priorities and we're opening up the UK economy to global opportunities. That's often contradictory to things like tariffs to protect industries in certain areas. And now after the Chesham and Amersham by-election, you can already see that that tension is growing. So Boris Johnson gave his big leveling up speech last week and he said, yes, we're going to level up the North. But then he said, I don't believe making the South poorer is the way to do that. Now, how can you level up an area that's poorer than, than one area 
by keeping the richer area as rich. Um, sh surely you need to, if, if one area stays privileged, then the other area isn't going to catch up. So people criticize that speech saying, well, what, what does that mean? How can you reconcile those two things? And I would say he doesn't know. I mean, there's no evidence to say he knows that. So Northern, Tor Northern and Midland Tory MPs who wouldn't normally be in this position are now starting to panic. They're starting to put pressure on the PM and say, well, what is this leveling up agenda? We need something now because we might lose our seats in 2023 or 2024, whatever, or whenever the election will come. So I think the Cheshire and Amersham result has given him a big headache. And I would argue now the Tories will start reverting to type and they'll focus on their heartlands, which is an opportunity for Labour at the next election if they can sort themselves out and start enthusing people on the ground again, which at the moment they're not doing. Of course, Boris Johnson just recently gave a big speech about levelling up, which was quite widely criticised as being incredibly vague about what levelling up actually meant. Um, yeah. Of course, if, if you're right about what uh, about Boris Johnson reverting to type and the Tories reverting to type and focusing on you know the South and the home counties, you're right, that does give Labour an opportunity to capitalise and take advantage of the Northern seats. Is Boris Johnson just so uh, to say, okay, um, let's focus on the North and leave the home counties? In some ways, that might be, you know, I, I, I don't want to give the Tory strategic advice here, so ignore what I'm saying. But um, you know, if you're to focus on the North, I think you're more likely to be able to count on the home counties to, you know, when Cup comes to chase, say, okay, you know, maybe I'm considering turning away, but if you know what I mean. Yeah. Will the Lib Dems hold Chesham and Amersham in 2023 or 2024? Maybe. I mean, they won it fairly convincingly this time, let's be clear. Um, if they run a good local campaign again, I mean, the electorally smart move for the Lib Dems now would be to go ultra local, ultra specific, and, you know, fighting the entire general election campaign just focused on winning over Remain voting Tory seats in the home counties in the South. Whether they'll do that's another matter. But of course, then remains our question of the day of what, how do Labour claw back support coming the next general election? And of course, Labour was a, um, was a different uh, entity now, perhaps under Starmer than it was under Corbyn. As it is under any leader, let's face it. I mean, Labour is a broad church, but its public face will always be defined by its leader. Now, of course, you work for the Morning Star, an explicitly socialist publication. So I'll ask you, what, do, what does it mean to you, Matt, to be a socialist? Well, it's a good question. Um, I think there's a lot of confusion about what socialism is, because obviously, a lot of discourse around socialism in society is very negative because the right wing will mercilessly attack the phrase. It's, it's always seems to be used in a negative context, particularly in the corporate media. Um, there's always an assumption that it's a bad thing and they don't really discuss what it is or why it's bad. But I think the other issue is that people on the left don't agree what socialism is. There isn't really a, a, a defined um, definition of, of what it is. I think for me, I just go back to what, what Tony Benn said about it. You know, socialism is production based on need and not just profit. Um, I think under capitalism, the instinct is to commodify everything. So some things you could argue perhaps need to be commodified, you know, um, money can be useful. Um, if you want to buy some luxury bread from a lovely deli down the road, then perhaps you should have the freedom to do that. Why not? But 
why should all food be commodified? Because then you've got a big problem because people that don't have access to money, perhaps for reasons that are beyond their control, are then starving. And surely that's wrong. And I, I think that's the point that socialists make, that not everything can or should be commodified. And I think if the left can find a way to get that point across, that it's not, it's not a, it, socialism doesn't mean we have to be like the Soviet Union because there were some good things that happened there, but it was just way too top down, too many doesn't big industries controlled by. Blue boiler suits drinking victory. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't mean that. It just means that um, the state has a role in protecting people from the ravages of the free market, which in my opinion, doesn't work. You, you can't rely on the free market to deliver human need or to meet human need because we've seen that during the pandemic. Um, you know, Boris Johnson still stands up and says some things are crazed communism like um, free broadband or whatever, but look at the vaccine rollout. You know, it's, it's... We now have an Ayn Rand admirer as our health secretary. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, the the state has stepped in and said, here is a free vaccine that you all need and that you all should have. None of you have to pay. There are no qualifications. There's no social insurance. There you go. You must have it. And of course, it's, it's working. So even in our neoliberal society, there are, there are elements of socialism that, that work. And I think the left needs to put that across. Also, it's this concept of freedom, I think, that the left struggles with, because the Tory party, when the left says, oh, maybe we should nationalise this industry, or maybe there should be more regulation of the banks, the Tories just say, freedom, you're impinging on freedom. And, and that, that kind of makes apparent sense to people. They're like, well, yeah, we don't want that, because then I don't have my freedoms. But I think about the freedom I have at the moment. I mean, I, I don't have a freedom to um, buy my own home, for example, because things are too expensive. That There are so many freedoms that I don't have. After this embrace of neoliberalism in the 80s, everything was about me, my personal freedom. I can do what I like. I can say what I like. I can buy an SUV and destroy the planet because it's my right. We need to move away from that. The pandemic has shown us that we're all interconnected, that we all have responsibilities as well as rights. And it's going to take a hell of a lot to change that because this thinking is everywhere. I mean, turn I mean, your TV on thing. right now, you're probably looking at a reality TV show where individuals are pitted against each other in competition. And we're told that's, that's the way human beings naturally are. But it isn't. We've seen that in the pandemic. You know, what has most people's response been? Most people's response has been, I'll stay at home, I'll wear a mask. Polls show that most people still want to wear a mask now and they want to help their neighbour. But and we probably don't even know our neighbour anymore. Speaking of someone who's been out into shops since quote unquote Freedom Day, I mean, more than yeah. half of the people, well more than half of the people are still wearing masks. Yeah, I haven't noticed a massive difference. And... <laughs> That, that says it all. There, is still, there's still, there are some people not wearing masks now, but, you know, mm. most people still are. And, you know, people, people like to draw analogies between, you know, the pandemic and the war. And, you know, can you imagine what the sort of the anti-lockdown sorts would have been like during the Blitz? You know, they'll be out campaigning for their rights to keep their lights on during the blackout. And then, yeah. and then once people say, oh, no, the, uh, point out to them, you know, hey, uh, keeping your lights on during the blackout, you know, means you're putting everyone else at risk from the German bombers. They'll be putting out studies, you know, nonsense studies on their Facebook feed saying why actually keeping your lights on deters the German bombers because you yes. know then they'll be attracted to the other lights that are shining off the white cliffs of Dover or something like that. <laughs> it's just absurd. It's just absurd. It is. It is. I mean, thank God we didn't have those people back then. Um, I think the point is that. We need, we need to make that clear that things weren't always like this. In fact, relatively recently, they were very different. But, you know, the, these ideas just seep into every aspect of our lives. And 
I think we saw with, well, we've seen during the pandemic and we saw with the election result in 2017 when Corbyn did pretty well, wasn't far off winning, that, that there is an appetite for, for this kind of stuff. Labour just need to tap into it. And at the minute, everyone's very disillusioned because the choice is between Johnson and Starmer, who, in my opinion, are too close together. Um, but but it's, it's there. People are just waiting for a rallying point, I think. I think the bottom line is Starmer doesn't have that passion. He's not inspiring anyone. No, and this just ridiculous response after the Hartlepool election where they asked him, you know, what, what are you about? What are you going to change? And he just said, I'm about change and I will change the things that need to be changed. I mean, just what? It's just utter yeah, God. What is going on camera and say, I'm in favour of good things and I'm against bad things. Yeah, it just, it means nothing and people yeah. see through it. I mean, and I think I that... I don't know if you Labour watched need... Owen Jones's, uh, when Owen Jones on his channel... And you know, I I had to recommend it. Um, went up to Hartlepool and interviewed the Labour candidate and asked him, "What does Labour stand for?" I mean, you can guess how much of a street answer he got. Yeah, probably it stands for what it stands for, and I'm not going to tell you anything else. Probably might as well have been. Yeah, and if you can't answer that, a basic question. It's, it's not a complex policy issue of where do you stand on social care, which um, you could debate for hours how to fund that. It's just, what are you about? And I think under Corbyn, people knew what Labour stood for. Whether it really irritated me. You knew. Yeah. It, it, under Thatcher, that's what people said, like, well, at least exactly. you know what she stood for, even if you don't agree with it. Whereas under Corbyn, people seem to forget that principle. They just said, oh, we don't like what he stands for. Well, you know, he, he well, stood for it and he, he got a lot of support for it initially. So um, I, th I think I think with Corbyn, one of the things that, you know, kind of soiled that was the Brexit stance in 2019. You know, that, that kind of destroyed his image as sort of this principal politician who sticks to his guns. You know, he changed, you know, what was then the key issue of the day. He massively changed his stance between two elections that were just two years apart. Yes, and it also kind of allowed the Tories to present yes. him as... as a um, he stuck to his guns. Yeah, and it also allowed the Tories to present him as... Uh, an establishment figure who was who was obstructing the will of the people and Johnson could then pretend that um, bizarrely the man who went to Eton was a man of the people. Now I have to point out as well that Sir Keir Starmer was instrumental in forcing that policy change on Jeremy Corbyn saying that we mustn't leave the EU and we must have a referendum another referendum with remain on the ballot paper because it would be a disaster if we didn't. And since becoming a leader in April last year, he's barely mentioned Brexit and, of course, just voted through the government's um, Brexit withdrawal agreement in December with, with barely a mention. So um, maybe some people would disagree with me, but I would argue that his Brexit stance before he became leader was more about him getting the job he wanted than a, a principled stance on, on Brexit. I mean, I think there's an extent to it. It's probably both. I mean, I think, I think Starmer, I think Starmer, the way it holds a similar position in Labour is Theresa May did for the Tories, albeit without being in power in Starmer's case, you know, just woke up and smelt the coffee and realised, you know, even though they were a main of themselves, there's not a lot they can do at this point. Yes, obviously the political wind changed by the time he became leader, but I think it was obvious to anyone that Labour adopting a pro-Remain stance would cost them the 2019 general election. Look, 2017, Labour stood like the Tories on a platform of respecting the referendum result, but unlike the Tories, Labour was saying austerity has to end. And the Tories said it can't, there's no magic money tree, and they were punished. In 2019, the Tories were agreeing with Labour suddenly, saying, oh yes, austerity is bad, we're going to end it, even though they haven't. But 
the Tories were saying we're respecting the will of the people, we're going to deliver on the Brexit vote, whereas Labour and its Islington North MP, Jeremy Corbyn, had been forced into a position where it was saying, essentially, we're going to leave open the possibility of overturning that referendum result. And that was the difference. I mean, the, there were a lot of strategic errors in Labour's part. You know, the, the Tories learned their lessons from 2017. They knew what they got wrong. Whereas Labour just assumed they could put off a repeat of 2017 without even, you know, stepping back to appreciate the fact, even though they performed better than they expected, they still lost 2017. Yeah. Um, I think even little things like the famous Andrew Neil interviews where he talks to the party Which Boris candidates, Johnson, you know. Uh, chickened out of. Yeah, well, Boris Johnson just said, I'm not doing it. And obviously it hurt him a little bit because people didn't hurt him of, enough. I mean, people no, they saw he enough. lacked integrity, but he realized that doing the interview would hurt him even more. Exactly. So he just did a kind of Trump esque think, move and uh, said, the, I'm the, not doing the sort, it. The sort of people who would have been swung over by the sort of you know, Boris Johnson is dodging interviews like that rhetoric are the sort of people who would have been voting Labour or Lib Dem in the first place, mostly. And there certainly was enough who would have been voting Tory to swing it. Yes, um, many people will just see any kind of story like that as Westminster bubble gossip and not be interested, but uh, yeah. a compilation of absolute howlers that for sure would have would have been generated by that interview. Um, I mean, that, that look at what's happening today with the Northern like... Ireland Protocol and Brexit, you know. Why did they sign up to that policy if they're now saying it's destroying the fabric of the UK? And Andrew Neil would have highlighted that. He would have said, well, this is just absurd. So, yeah, he just didn't do it because he knew that would, that would be I the just, result. It just always sticks with me that moment in the Tory leadership election campaign between Boris Johnson and Jeremy Hunt, when they were both interviewed by Andrew Neil. And there's a moment when Andrew Neil was questioning Boris Johnson on certain clauses of... Um, Uh, you'll forgive me for, forget, for forgetting which treaty it was on the spot or one, which agreement it was on the spot. And Boris Johnson, he says, so what would you say about, I think it was like, what would you say about Clause C? And Boris Johnson's like, I place all my faith in Clause B. And Andrew Neil's like, do you know what Clause C says? And Boris Johnson just completely confidently says, no. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot to yeah. unpack there. Both the fact that we have a potential prime minister candidate who's just so gleefully and knowingly ignorant about matters like that, and and uh, and an electorate within the Tory party then who didn't care. Yeah, he was just the anointed leader, and and I just don't see how anything could have stopped him. Then I mean, it really irritates me when people say Boris Johnson is funny. It's like that that quote from Friends when Joey says, "If he's funny, laugh." <laughs> don't vote for him, you know, because you don't want a funny person making the difficult decisions when things get tough. I mean, look, look what's happened with COVID, you know, the, the Dominic Cummings saying that he's in meetings just laughing and telling jokes and they just hoped he didn't turn up so they could get stuff done. I know that's Dominic Cummings. He's not a, a reliable source, but yeah. that, that just makes sense. It makes sense from what other people say about him, and it makes sense about the way he makes decisions. You know, it's um, mm. I don't know. It's 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 very it's very sad. No, just, uh, just as we wrap up, then because mm. I, f I feel we're pushing on our time limit here. Um, in an ideal world, who would be your Labour candidate for the next election? Um, well, at the moment, I'd probably say Andy Burnham. Um, I think realistically, he's the candidate at the moment who could potentially reunite the party and he could potentially win a general election particularly winning back some of those former red wall seats. But one of the interesting it's not things ideal. Burnham there, though, is that his former seat of Lee was one of the ones that was one of those red wall seats that did fall to the Tories. 
yeah, that's the thing. It, it's it's not ideal. It's um, not ideal. No, I mean, I think that's, I, I that's what's helping Starman. There. I think Andy, like I said earlier in this show, I think Andy Burnham has the potential to be that Biden figure. That's someone who came originally had the right wing training, but is amenable to working to a broad church and actually bringing everyone on board. And um, he could do that. Like I say, he has that. And he's had that um, stomping ground as mayor of Greater Manchester to actually prove his worth as an administrator as well. He's got a record to defend, and it's a good record, no less. He got re-elected on a bigger majority than he did before. So I think Andy Burnham would be a solid candidate. The question is, can he end up in Parliament in time? Yeah, I'm sure they could find a way if they wanted it. He's probably thinking a bit longer term, but... um... And especially after the Batley and Spen he's result, still he's probably second. He's what, like early fifties? Yeah, that's the thing. He's got time. I will. I will, and just, I will just look it up while we're here. I think after Batley and Spen as well, he's probably put any any temptations to the back of his mind because he knows Sakir is is safe for now. Fifty one, yes. Yeah. So I think Sakir so is what got late plenty 50s, of time. So. Yeah. Hmm. Um. But I think that's what's helping Starmer at the moment because there isn't that obvious alternative. Um, but things, I don't think things can go on as they are because at the moment, Labour are not, Labour are not going to win the next general election, which should be after the horrors of the last 18 months, a piece of cake. You know, I, I, I wouldn't bet on Labour winning that general election. I wouldn't count them out, you know. Labour Labour in 2017 came back from being 24 points down to being just two points down on election day in the space of six weeks or whatever it was. So, you know... Yeah, it's not impossible. Whether they will or not, but I wouldn't bet on this at the moment. They have to win 124 seats just to win a simple majority in the House of Commons. if, if If there's a moment for optimism, it's this. That Labour won more seats in 2019 than the Tories did in 2005. Yeah. And the Tories went on to win the next election then, albeit without a majority. And counted, counted on, counted on uh, who is now Sir Nick Clegg for support. Let that sink in. Yes, the Facebook legend. Yes. Um, well, yeah, the, the Tories won about 100 more seats, didn't they, in 2010? So they ended up with about 305 and then formed a coalition deal with the Lib Dems. So it's not impossible. And of course, Sakir Starmer would be more open to a coalition deal with the Lib Dems. They probably wouldn't be. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it's not impossible, but it's, it's going to be very, very difficult. And they need to, they need to improve. For sure, and I don't, I don't, I don't think they're capable of that. I don't think they want to do what's necessary to win because I don't think their game really is kind of devolution of the party and and community organising. I don't, I don't think they want they want that. They're, they're doing everything they can, it, it seems, to to reduce the membership. In in my book, they're they're in very difficult financial trouble, as was revealed in yesterday's NEC meeting. Um, so. The best way to change that is to get more members. You know, they had six hundred thousand under Corbyn, and I don't know what they have now, but not many. So certainly fewer. Yeah, and and none of the wealthy donors are coming over to them as they expected. They're still sticking with the Tories. So um, oh, that's why that's why the Unite uh, General Secretary election is going to be a major turning point. But I think that's a I think that's a subject for another podcast. Yes, that's for late August when we know the result, I think. I know. But anyway, I think I think we're at time to wrap up there. Um, thank Sounds you, thank good. you everyone so much for tuning in once again. Uh, I've been James Moles, co-editor of Redaction. This is Matt, uh, parliamentary reporter of the Morning Star. Please uh, subscribe, click the bell below, and we will see you once again very soon. Thanks very much once again for tuning in. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye.